We've been talking for a few weeks here at Glory Baptist Church about leaving a legacy. And, and it would seem, at least from your reactions over the past few weeks, that most of you are enjoying the series and tracking quite well with it. And, and one of the greatest possible ways that we as Christians can leave a legacy in this world is for us to lead somebody to faith. That can leave a, a legacy that goes on and on and on for generations. So keep that in mind today as you listen to my sermon. You see, if you're, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, here's the question I would ask of you. How did you come to faith in Jesus? How, how did you become a Christian, right? What was the medium? I mean, we know the message. We understand what the message was. But uh, how did you become a Christian? Now, I think most people would simply say, I became a Christian because I, I grew up in a, in a Christian family, in a Christian household, right? Uh, a lot of people would say that. That, in fact, is the very most common way in which people come to know Christ as their Lord and Savior. They, they grew up in the church. They grew up in a family who followed Jesus. That's the majority. But that's not everyone. Then you've got people like me. See, I, I grew up in the church. I was like... I was a kid on drugs, right? They drug me to church. They drug me to church. They drug me to church. My parents were at church all the time. And when, despite their best efforts, no, no blame on their part. It was my hard-headedness and hard-heartedness. But despite their efforts, I didn't know Jesus. I didn't become a Christian until, in fact, I became a Christian in college. I was 19. I was out living on my own. And it was through the gracious love of some other men in my life Eventually, me seeing their lives, me seeing how they lived differently, and me wanting what it was that they had that I didn't have, that I hadn't understand, uh, understood up until that point, I could answer the questions about church, but I didn't understand. I didn't, I didn't get it at a heart level. And these men graciously shepherded me to faith. So, so for a number of us, we come to faith uh, in a different way, right? We come to faith because somebody intentionally came into our lives and told us about it. And then there's that other small category, but there are some. I have a friend who falls in this category of people who maybe you turned the TV on at the exact right or wrong time, depending on what you believe. But you turned on the TV or you turned on a radio or you picked up the wrong book or the right book. And... All of a sudden, you became a Christian, right? I'm not going to tell all of this story, but I've got a, a friend who was a classmate in seminary who was driving down the road in his Toyota Tercel, and he heard a voice that said, turn on the radio. He turned on his radio, had static, he dialed in a station, and on the first station that he found, Pastor R.C. Sproul was preaching. And within a mile, he had to pull over his car and give his life to Jesus. So that does happen, but Greg is the only person I could tell you in my life that I've ever met that that happened to, but it does happen. But no matter how it is that we have come to faith, it took somebody always to share the message of the gospel with us. It had to be communicated to us in some way by a person. Now, now here's the problem, I think, at least in what I view in America, it seems, and, and there's just this thing that it feels like we're struggling, like things are unraveling, right? And I think some of that simply comes because the majority of Christians, statistically this is backed up, the majority of Christians do not, have not, shared their faith with anyone in the past year three years, five years, or ten years. They're Christians, but statistically speaking, when asked, Christians who should be honest when asked, say, no, I, I really haven't shared my faith directly with anybody recently. And that's a problem. If we come to faith by somebody sharing the gospel with us, and we, the people of the gospel, are not sharing the gospel we have a problem. There's a disconnect. And, and I think that ongoing prolonged disconnect has somewhat directed us to this place where we find ourselves today. 
And, and, and I want to be clear. Sharing your faith is more than just putting that fish sticker on the back of your car, right? Sharing your faith is, is more than saying Merry Christmas than Happy Holidays. I mean, it's good to say Merry Christmas, and I like it if you've got a fish on the back of your car, unless you cut me off in traffic. And I begin to wonder what that fish was about. Maybe you're just an angler from up north, and you like fish. But there's more to it than that, right? It's our sharing of our faith. Now, many would say, many would say, well, the reason, Pastor, I I don't witness, I don't share my faith is, I don't know how. Well, that's a problem we need to work on. Others would say, well, you know, Pastor, I I just feel awkward when I share my faith, right? This is one that, oh man, I had a guy in my last church. I don't want to be one of those Bible-thumping Christians, he would say, right? I don't want to be that guy who is the fun-destroying Christian, right? As if Christians can't have fun, you know? Before I was a Christian, I actually believed that. I thought all the fun that I was having in my life was going to end when I became a Christian. That was one of the things that held me back, actually, for a while from taking that final step of faith. I thought I was having fun living as the world lives. I thought, I've become a Christian. I've got to quit doing all these things. Boring! Right? Wrong. I was abundantly amazed when my life was transformed and changed, about how my priorities changed and how what I thought was fun was actually being destructive in my life. And how, as I began to be transformed by the gospel, as my life began to shift and change and my priorities were rearranged, I was amazed. Wow, this is still kind of fun. I'm still having fun today. So it is incredibly important that, that we, we share our faith. And then, of course, there's those people who, and, and this is one, again, as a pastor, I hear, oh, pastor, I, I couldn't share my faith. My life is a mess, right? All of our lives are a mess. Let's be honest. We're all broken. We're all sinners. And truthfully, when your life is a mess and God is working in that mess and he's transforming you and he's changing you and he's doing amazing things in you, that's the best story that can be told. That is the most powerful example of the gospel, not the least. See, lost people matter to God. Lock that in. Lost people matter to God. Let's, let's just suppose for a minute that you lived in a community, in a country, where all of a sudden there was an outbreak of Ebola. Everybody has Ebola, right? You've all heard of Ebola in the news, how many millions of people it killed in Africa, right? Incredibly, incredibly infectious and deadly disease. Now imagine you came across a doctor, and that doctor was able to heal you, right? And able to get you on the right track. And, And he says, go tell other people, I'm available to help anybody. But then, you don't go and tell anybody. You don't go and share, hey, I found the doctor who can fix us. And yet, you say you love your neighbor. What kind of love is that then? And I need to say that as America has descended into secularism, We've seen this thing that's called the rise of the nuns. Have you heard of that? Not the Catholic nuns, not the ladies with the habits, but the rise of the nuns, N-O-N-E-S. The ones who say, I don't have any faith. I don't, I don't believe in any God. I don't follow any organized religious order of any sort. That number has skyrocketed recently, hasn't it? If you follow demographic studies. In order for us to make sure that the Christian faith continues to advance and grow and and move on and spread, I fully believe that more and more and more we are going to have to go back to the patterns of the New Testament in order for us to share our faith. The pattern of the New Testament, if you're not familiar with it, is, is personal relationships. That's where we get to share our faith, by being in relationship, by, by living life with others. It's within that that people will 
open their hearts and their ears and their minds to you and will listen to you. Another, another way in the, Old Test- in the New Testament that they, that they had that they would share faith is simply by hospitality. People would open their homes and invite people in. People would serve and love others in their homes. And through that, great opportunities to share faith came. And then the final one is just simply people in the New Testament were simply telling other people about why Jesus was so special to them. Just telling them. Just being open and honest. And then within that, the other people wanted to believe. So now here's what I'm going to do. I want you as a, a believer, and I'm going to assume today you're a believer. If you're not a believer, we're, we're glad that you're here today too. And, 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 and I invite you to listen in because the gospel is threaded throughout this. But uh, it, it, assuming we're believers here today, I want you to start thinking about somebody in your life who isn't a believer. Someone who hasn't taken that final step of faith. Someone who has not yet stepped over that line to say, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Just start thinking about them, okay? I'm going to come back to them at the end of the sermon. So just, whoever God has put in your mind, just just lock them in. Keep them there. Somebody who's pre-Christian. Somebody who hasn't yet come to saving faith. And as you think about that person while I'm speaking, and I come to the end of the message, it'll make more sense to you here. And, and what I want to do in between is, is paint a picture for you today, a vision of, of our privilege as believers that hopefully will excite you that as you leave here today, and as you go and you hopefully maybe talk to that person in the next week to come, you'll have an opportunity where God will open the door a little bit to begin to share your faith with them. The passage I'm going to work on today comes out of 2 Corinthians 5, verses 16 through 21. Uh, you're welcome. There's Bibles in the pew. If you have an iPhone, iPad, Android, you can open up Version. That's a really good at, at Bible app. Um, open up Version or, or uh, grab a Bible beneath. If you don't have a Bible on our Welcome Center, as you walk out the doors to the left, there's some blue Bibles there. Those are free Bibles for you to take with you. If you don't have a Bible, take one of those Bibles with you. That's a gift from us to you. We'd love to have you take that home with you. But if you have a Bible, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 21, almost exclusively today. And I would invite you to jump on in there. And just as an unrelated side note, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 is my favorite verse in all of the Bible. I love that verse. So 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 21. The, the Apostle Paul is speaking here. And as you listen, just... Listen to what Paul has to say to that church, but as well as to this church. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 5.16. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All of this is from God, who through Christ has reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And then the scripture goes on here to to say that, that he reconciled the world to himself, not counting their trespasses or their sins against them. And, and, And notice, he says that he has entrusted to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, as ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us, we implore you, Paul says, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Paul says, we are ambassadors. So let's think about that for a minute. What what is an ambassador? What's it mean to be an ambassador? Paul says we're all sent by God. See, to be an ambassador, that means you are sent. And notice how clear he makes it here. He says that God has entrusted you with the ministry of reconciliation. And so we have this ministry. We are the ambassadors. Who is he talking about? Well, first he's talking about these people of the church in Corinth. They, of course, were ambassadors in their culture and in their city. If you know anything about the the church at Corinth, it was this group of knuckleheads, right? 
If, if, if you want a summary of First and Second Corinthians, it was, hey, knuckleheads, that's not what I taught you. Knock it off and get back to the gospel. That's two books of the Bible summarized in one sentence. That's really what it was. And in and, and 2 Corinthians, in this church at Corinth, uh, they were an imperfect church, just like every church is an imperfect church. But still, they were called to represent Christ. Now, here's our responsibility. Paul would say that, that we belong to a heavenly kingdom. That's, that's our first and foremost nationality. This kingdom is above all. It's an invisible kingdom, but it's a very real kingdom, and, and we represent that kingdom. The kingdom of God we represent here on earth. In Philippians, Paul made the comment that our citizenship is in heaven, right? By the way, in the Greek, the word is politiuma, the word we get our politics from, right? Our politics are in heaven. Aren't you glad for that? I am. Now, one day, the disciples come up to Jesus, right? And they say, you know, Jesus, even the demons, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Well, what was Jesus' response? He said, well, that's fine, guys, but don't rejoice in the fact that the demons are subject to you. He said, rather, rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Paul says, we have been raised up with Christ and we are seated with him in heavenly places. Now here's the thing. We have the responsibility being ambassadors from that kingdom into this world. We have the message that says heaven is interested in you, right? That, that heaven is available to you. We as ambassadors have that message. We as ambassadors have the message that grace is extended to you. That, that forgiveness that God wants to be in relationship with you. He wants to be reconciled. And as Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, so I send you, right? So the very first characteristic of an ambassador is that we are sent, that we have been commissioned for, for this work. And we are sent. Every follower of Christ has been commissioned as an ambassador. All of us. Now, a second characteristic of ambassadors is that ambassadors represent their kingdom and not themselves. In fact, Paul even said it here in this passage that we should not live for ourselves, but for him who died for us and then rose again. You see, it's, it's not about you. It's about the person with whom we represent. And, and we do this by our conduct because people are going to judge our king by how his children conduct themselves. See, there, there's, there's a number of people in this world, a lot of people in this world, who, who don't get a very good impression of Jesus because of the Christians that they know. I mean, they go, yeah, 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 they're Christians, right? But have you watched how they live? You remember David, King David, right? When King David committed his twin sins of murder and adultery, God said this. God said to David, you have caused the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. God was saying to David, David, because of your sin, people are now mocking me because of what you did. And so the world judges us as Christians by our conduct. And I think you know that, right? I hear it as a pastor, you guys are just a bunch of hypocrites. Yes, we are. Welcome to the club. Let's be honest. We are hypocrites, each and every one of us. But when, when Christians act unchristianly, we make Jesus and the gospel look bad. So first of all, it's not about us. It's all about him. And we display that through our conduct. But we also display it through the message that we've been given that we need to preach. You'll notice in, in verse 16, if you're following along, he says, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. 
What Paul is saying here is this. We don't look, as pe- we don't, we don't look at people superficially like we used to. We don't just see warm bodies, right? We don't even just see the needs of those warm bodies. We as Christians are to look beyond that and be reminded of the fact that they're more than just warm bodies. These are people with eternal souls. We're dealing here with people whose need is greater than even they realize if they don't know Jesus. And then Paul says, God has committed unto us that ministry of reconciliation, right? That is, that God, who is in Christ reconciling himself to the world, not counting their trespasses or sins against them, that that God has entrusted this message to us as ambassadors. So what is that message then? It's a message of peace. See, the average non-believer believes that God is probably mad at them and more than likely out to get them. That was me, in a nutshell, before I came to Christ. I knew there was a God. I didn't have a relationship with that God. And I thought that that God was waiting for me to screw up so he could punish me. Right? Right? I didn't understand, no, that's not God. I didn't understand, no, that God loved me so much that he sent his one and only son to die for my stupidity, for my selfishness, for my sin. That's not a God of anger. That's not a God of punishment. That's a God of love. God gives us as ambassadors a message of peace and reconciliation. That when Jesus died, God took away all the barriers that may exist so that we might be reconciled with him. Call on him as our father. Abba, father. And then belong to him forever. That, folks, is our message. And people don't understand that about God. And the reason people don't understand it about God is because more often than not, we're not telling people that about God. And so Paul says that God has committed to us this ministry of explaining to people who God is. The coming of Jesus. And then there's this wonderful verse, verse 21. It says, For our sake, he, God, made him, Christ, to be sin." The one who knew no sin became our sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You've heard me say this before, but Jesus got what he did not deserve, our sin. And we get what we don't deserve, his righteousness. And that is the message we proclaim. It's a message of hope in a world filled with darkness and despair and pain, and suffering. It's a message that says to the world out there, there's more to life than just the emptiness that you experience. There's more to life than than chasing after a simple cheap thrill. There's more to life than what alcohol, or drugs, or sex, or money, or things will do for you. There's more to life than that. God is in Christ, and through him we proclaim this message of reconciliation. So that's the second characteristic as an ambassador. Here's the third one. Ambassadors look to their king for their resources. See, they look to their king or they look to their country for their resources. See, if if we were to go to Berlin today, and we went to the American consulate there, right? To the embassy... When we step inside those gated walls, even though we're in Berlin, Germany, we are standing on American soil. That, that small little compound, that small little space, is just like we were sitting here in Aiken County, as far as America is concerned. And they look back to their king, or in our case, our country, we don't have a king, for the support that they need, right? 
what they need in order to be an ambassador. They need resources, they need money, they need directions. And all of that supplied by the United States. That's their source. You see, God didn't say to us, I'm making you ambassadors, I'm calling you, I'm entrusting you to, with this great ministry, with this wonderful message. But there you go, you're on your own. Get out there, go team. Right? God didn't do that. He didn't just shove us out of the car door as he was driving down the road 55 miles per hour and let us go. That's not what God does. No, he gave us the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he says, it is the Spirit who, through you, will convince the world and convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. God says he will do it through you. You see, the Holy Spirit doesn't just work sovereignly in a vacuum. Very, very seldom is a guy walking down the street and, you know, God strikes him down with Christianity. That's pretty rare. That's just not the way the Holy Spirit tends to work in our world, right? The way the Holy Spirit works is the Holy Spirit works through you and me. Jesus said, when the Spirit comes to you through, who, through you, he will convince the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And so that is why we can share our faith with hope and optimism. We never know if the person we're going to be sharing our faith with is, is receptive to it. We never know if that person is going to believe because of what we say. But this much we do know, that they might, they might believe if God grants to them in that moment eternal life. And he might just do that through our message. And so we share the gospel in faith, believing that God's will will be done. Now look at what Paul says earlier in verse 14. He says, for the love of Christ controls you. Or, or compels you. Let me be very candid for just a moment. If you have no concern about the spiritual state of your neighbor, if, if you say, I love my neighbor, but I don't care whether or not he or she ever has saving faith in Jesus Christ, if that's you, your love for Jesus has grown very cold. Paul says it's the love of Christ that is compelling us to witness and to represent him into our fallen world. Our fallen, confused, hurting, broken world. And so we need to actually be able to prove to people our love for Christ through the way in which we act, through our commitment to them and their needs. Now, you, you might say, Pastor, oh, man, I feel so in inadequate. Or, or, oh, here's the bad one. Pastor, I feel ashamed to share the gospel. It's so awkward when it comes to sharing faith, right? That word ashamed is a problem. You know what Jesus said? He said, he who is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes to glory. Powerful words from Jesus. You know how you get better at doing something? You practice, right? It's no secret. You get better at doing things by practicing. You want to be an incredible quilter? It's going to take you a lot of hours sitting in front of a sewing machine, putting strips of cloth together, piece after piece, stitch after stitch. But if you do it long enough and you do it often enough, you can become pretty good at it. You want to be good at shooting free throws. How many free throws do you think a guy like LeBron James has practiced in his life? More than we could count. A lot. You get good at doing something simply by practicing it. And the first time you do it, yeah, you may be building a brick house if you're shooting free throws, right? Bang! Or you might miss the whole thing. 
But if you missed your first shot, did you stop playing? I hope not. You kept trying. You kept practicing. You kept learning. You kept growing, right? You kept at it. And it's the same thing when we're sharing our faith. Yeah, maybe that first time, it's going to feel awkward. Maybe the second time, it's still going to feel awkward. Maybe the 37th time, it's still going to feel a little bit awkward, but a little bit less awkward. And the more you do it, the better you will get. And the better you get, the more opportunities God will give you. See, we're talking about leaving a legacy, aren't we? You want to leave a legacy that lasts? Lead somebody to faith. That's a legacy that can last for generations. You want to impact this world and make a difference in this world? Lead somebody to Jesus. I'm going to wrap up with three more quick points to lock this in in your memory. A, B, C. Okay? You remember that? A, B, C? A. The A stands for ask. When you're going to go share your faith with someone, ask God for wisdom. Ask God for the right timing and ask God who you should share your faith with. Ask God. It starts in prayer. Just ask God. A. Can we do that? Ask God. In your bulletins, there's an A there. Ask God. The second B is believe. Believe that God can overcome. Believe that God can overcome the darkness in the human heart. Believe that God can overcome the distance, the barriers, the objections, the worries that you might have, whatever it is. Believe that God is in it and will be with you as you share your faith. Believe. See, see, God has saved some pretty horrible sinners. Believe. God has saved people like you and me. And I think if we sat here and shared some stories, yeah, we'd go, whew, that's a good one. You were a sinner. And if God can save people like you and me, believe that God can save this other person he's put in your life too. And then see. See is connect. Ask God, believe, and then connect. Connect with that person. Think, think of ways to make a connection with that person. Remember I told you to start thinking about a person at the beginning of the sermon? Who is that God has put on your heart? You need to ask God. You need to believe. And now you need to connect with that person. How can you go have lunch with them? How can you tell your faith story? See, sometimes people aren't open to, well, let's sit down and I want to tell you about my friend Jesus, right? Awkward. I'm a pastor, and if you invite me to lunch and that's the conversation you start off with, I'm going to go, I'm not hungry. But if you sit down and say, hey, let me tell you my story. People are interested in stories. Here's my story. I was this, and God got a hold of me. And this happened. And here's how he's working in my life today. That person may not want to have anything to do with Jesus, but they can't deny your story. They can't deny how God has worked in your life. So see, look for opportunities to connect with that person that God has placed in your heart. And then once you've made that connection, stay connected. Follow up. Be in their lives. There's nothing worse than just coming in, let me tell you about Jesus. And then he disappear. Well, where'd they go? I thought they cared about me. No, connect. ABC. Folks, it's the gospel that saves. And God says, I have committed to you as believers the message of reconciliation. That's the message, folks. Forgiveness is available. God says, I have done it all. My arms are open. My back is not turned. Come home, to, come home to me. If you want to leave an amazing, amazing legacy, share your faith. Amen. Let's pray.